It's the world's most debunked UFO claim, but still, some parts don't add up. From strange debris to alien autopsies, here are some bizarre details about Roswell that still don't make sense. On June 14, 1947, a rancher named William Mac Brazel found some wreckage on his ranch around 75 miles outside of Roswell, New Mexico. He didn't know what to make of it, so he brought the debris home and then delivered it to the sheriff from Roswell. Brazel described the crash site as being a large area with bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, tough paper, and sticks. It sounds less than otherworldly. The military was soon involved, and Brazel's name was cascading through the wires attached to the story of a flying disc. In an interview with the Roswell Daily Record the next day, Brazel already expressed regret at the publicity and said that the debris was a weather balloon. He was more than willing to call it something mundane if it meant that people would no longer associate his name with aliens. Unfortunately for him, it didn't work. Major Jesse Marcel appeared on the scene, and images of him holding the wreckage is integral to the debunking of the UFO theory. However, according to a later interview, he claimed the wreckage displayed to the press was fake. The actual debris was types of material which he couldn't identify, including wood-like material with hieroglyphics on it, which, though flexible, could neither be broken nor burned. The military purportedly brought the debris back to base and tried without success to put it back together before Marcel's commanding officer ordered him to load some of the material into a small plane and fly it to Carswell Air Force Base. There, Marcel was photographed with the wreckage, but said that he was careful not to put out anything with detail on it. He claimed that after he left, officers at Carswell created a mock display with a battered weather balloon for the press to photograph. Marcel waited three decades to tell his side publicly. His son Jesse Jr. said that his father had finally come to the conclusion that it was a story that should not be contained or buried. Skeptics point out that Marcel had a history of boasting of military accomplishments that were verifiably false. Why would Roswell be any different? Once the debris arrived at the Roswell Air Base on July 8th, Base Commander Colonel William Blanchard authorized a press release declaring that a flying disc was captured by the Air Force. The Roswell Daily Record ran a story that said, The Intelligence Office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into the possession of a flying saucer. Why would the consistently conservative military state something so incendiary if it were not true? The next day, Brigadier General Roger Ramey held a press conference in which he aggressively walked this back, saying that it was only, quote, a harmless high-altitude weather balloon. The Albuquerque Journal reports that the debris was likely from a train of research balloons that was launched out of Alamogordo Army Airfield on June 4, 1947. The airfield officers lost contact with it 17 miles from Brazel Ranch. Years later, atmospheric scientist Charles B. Moore, who helped launch it, showed the Albuquerque Journal a device much like the photographed wreckage. There was no mention of alien bodies in the 1947 report of the incident, but mentions of alien corpses appear in ufology books and articles from 1978 on. In a 1997 report, the Air Force stated that lifelike dummies were dropped out of research balloons through the 1950s. Though the official timeline of this research started after Roswell, some speculate that the program may have begun earlier than reported. The Air Force report stated that the object of the studies was to devise a method to get a pilot or astronaut back to Earth by parachute if forced to escape at extreme altitudes. The report noted that one of the dummies, quote, very likely could be mistaken for an alien, a response that was laughable to UFO researchers. But this could account for the dummy alien's blank eyes, bluish-white skin, and bizarre outfits that the military claimed were pressure suits. Also, the dummies weighed 250 pounds each, so they were hard to move. That's why the military employed stretchers to retrieve them, of course. Then, to transport them back to base, they put them in an ambulance. Obviously. In 1989, 42 years after the Roswell incident, a mortician named Glenn Dennis saw the Unsolved Mysteries episode about Roswell. However, eyewitness accounts and disturbing evidence suggest that something strange happened here at Roswell. Something that cannot be easily dismissed. After listening to Robert Stack recount the story, he contacted famed ufologist Stanton Friedman. He told Friedman that he had not only been on Roswell Army Airfield that day in 1947, but that he had seen the aliens. The military needed child-sized coffins. Apparently, dead aliens necessitated human funeral customs. Dennis also said that a huge-headed alien was seen wandering around the base. He was threatened to keep quiet on the pain of death. Much of what is accepted in the modern alien version of the Roswell incident comes directly from Dennis's statements. What is strange is not that he made these claims, but that Air Force researchers have corroborated most of them. Sort of. Rather than taking place over a few days, the Air Force claims the incidents Dennis described occurred over 12 years, and they did not involve a crashed saucer. 
There had been wreckage and a threatening colonel, but the panels Dennis described were the steel panels of a canoe, and the colonel in the story didn't work at the base until 1956. In the year of Dennis's story, mortuary staff did struggle to autopsy mangled bodies from an aircraft accident due to overpowering fumes. The huge-headed creature wandering around was likely Captain Dan Fulgen, who in 1959 received a massive hematoma from an injury that inflated his head. Dennis would go on to found the International UFO Museum and Research Center, with mannequins replicating what he claims happened in Roswell. On his deathbed, Lt. Walter Hawks, the public relations officer on base that day in 1947, admitted in an affidavit to be opened after his death that the weather balloon story was always a cover-up. He had seen the actual object, which was kept in a hangar. He had been in the presence of alien bodies, and in something that later fell into the canon of the event but was not reported on until later, he knew about a second crash site. Unlike many who spoke of their experiences that day, it is a known fact that he was on site. At the end of his affidavit, he wrote, I am convinced that what I personally observed was some kind of craft and its crew from outer space. Oddly, even in interviews that he gave close to his death, he did not make any of these claims and downplayed that anything much had happened that day. The best argument against the affidavit being true is that Hawk may not have been of sound mind when he wrote it. But what would he gain from making up a false account other than the strange immortality of being forever wrapped up in the story? Perhaps it's relevant that he co-founded the International UFO Museum with Glenn Dennis. Joseph Beeson found Kodachrome slides among the effects of a woman called Hilda Blair Ray after her death. Two of the slides show a shriveled small creature in a glass case with an unreadable placard attached, its skull long and its eye sockets large. Beeson contacted his former business partner and videographer Adam Dew. They contacted Tom Carey, a retired businessman with a background in anthropology who has written books about Roswell. Carey reportedly found the evidence dubious and Beeson too secretive, so they had a digital illustrator make a 3D image of what the body might look like alive. Once Carey had a scan, he was nearly convinced. They also sent the slides to Kodak. The company confirmed that they were not tampered with and were from 1945 to 1950. The men tried to find details about Ray's life that would justify her having rubbed shoulders with an alien. Dew brought the photos to Eliezer Benavides, a veteran who claimed to have seen the Roswell aliens. Benavides said, that's what I saw in 1947. Emboldened, Kerry proclaimed at a UFO conference in 2014, we have the smoking gun. They sought money for a documentary, and they held a live stream event titled Be Witness, charging 7,000 people between $20 and $86 per ticket. Days after the event, someone involved leaked a high-resolution scan. Using a photo-enhancing program, the placard in the image could finally be read, mummified body of two-year-old boy. Skeptics found who had donated the mummy to the Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum and also discovered photos of its initial discovery in 1896. The office of the Secretary of the Air Force admitted in 1994 that there was indeed a cover-up. It was never a weather balloon. Apparently, the aircraft that crashed was a 600-foot spy balloon meant to sit above the troposphere and detect if Russia had nuclear weapons. This was all part of an operation called Project Mogul. And a lie, Mr. Mulder, is most convincingly hidden between two truths. The military couldn't admit this at the time without compromising the operation. It was such a big secret that it was given the same security level as the atomic bomb project. Roger Launius, the former curator of space history at the National Air and Space Museum, said, It was better from the Air Force's perspective that there was a crashed alien spacecraft out there than to tell the truth. An estimated 1 billion people watched Alien Autopsy Fact or Fiction, a documentary about the black and white video of the supposed dissection of one of the Roswell aliens. Time reports that Fox acquired the rights to Ray Santilli and Gary Shufield's 17 minutes of footage, releasing it in 1995. It featured interviews with scientists and special effects experts, all of whom were baffled. Several skeptics highlight how clear it is the video is faked, the camera going out of focus to hide the alien's flaws, the fact that the creators did not submit the film stock for verification, and the cinematic film cuts that don't show any time jumps. Those who were critical in the Fox program had their interviews cut. On the British program Amen Investigates in 2006, Santilli confessed that he knew that he had sold a fake video. However, that was only because the real autopsy tape was too severely degraded to be used. As such, he had precisely recreated what the tape had shown, saying, It's no different than restoring a work of art like the Mona Lisa. John Humphreys, who did special effects for Max Headroom and Doctor Who, was hired to make the alien using sheep brains, chicken entrails, and bones from a butcher's shop. Once filming closed, the producers chopped the dummies up and dumped them in garbage cans throughout London, which could have made a far better story than an alien autopsy. 
Recently, there was Area 51, a book written by Los Angeles-based independent journalist Annie Jacobson, which claimed that there were no aliens at Roswell. According to Jacobson's unnamed source, supposedly a veteran both of the Manhattan Project and Area 51, there were bodies at the scene, just not of the alien variety. They belonged to children who had been stuffed into a fake UFO, a single-wing Horton Ho 229, as a false flag event. Who would do such a thing? Nazi war criminal Dr. Joseph Mengele. A source told Jacobson that Mengele didn't develop this plan, but was directed by Joseph Stalin, inspired by the War of the Worlds broadcast to execute it. While the finer points are improbable, the idea that there is a connection between UFOs and political movements isn't. The Robertson panel convened in 1953 to decide what should be told to the public regarding UFOs in order to minimize the risk of panic. The CIA was concerned not about aliens, but that a nervous public would have their fear taken advantage of. They believed that the Soviets would find a way to use the huge level of interest in UFOs to somehow manipulate the public and cause a panic. That would then be used to undermine national cohesiveness. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.